Hi, this is Heidi Burgess. In this video, I want to talk about what kinds of conflicts we'll be discussing in this seminar. Or put another way, what are intractable conflicts and are they real? Well, we know they're real because we have been arguing about that question for over 20 years. As we have been studying these conflicts, we've discovered that most scholars agree with our notion that some conflicts are intractable. They may call them different things. They may call them deep-rooted or protracted, a term that's getting more commonly used right now that is similar is wicked problems. But everybody who is looking at this kind of situation agrees that basically the problem exists. It's real. Some practitioners, on the other hand, argue that there's no such thing as intractable conflicts. They say there are intractable people. Some say there is bad statecraft or tradecraft, but they tend to think that the only reason that conflicts appear intractable is that they haven't been handled properly. We don't agree. We believe that conflicts are intractable when they lie at the frontier of the conflict resolution field stubbornly eluding resolution even when the best available techniques are applied. Now keep in mind, when we say a conflict is intractable, it does not mean that it's impossible. It just means that we don't know how to deal with it effectively yet. So figuring out better ways to deal with these conflicts is the purpose of this seminar. Another way to define intractable conflicts that we used for many years is suggested by this document which is called Best Practices for Government Agencies, Guidelines for Using Collaborative Agreement-Seeking Processes. This was written by an organization called SPIDER, the Society for Professionals in Dispute Resolution, which became ACR, or the Association of Conflict Resolution. This document was written in 1997. As I remember, it was about 30 pages long, and about half of it talked about when you shouldn't use collaborative agreement-seeking processes because they won't work. Our argument at the time was that means they are intractable. We thought that somebody needed to start focusing on how to deal with those conflicts rather than just finding better ways to deal with the easy ones. A colleague of ours wrote a book about seven years ago, I'm estimating that, called The 5% that dealt with intractable conflicts, and he did use that term. He called them 5% conflicts also because he claimed that 5% at all, of all conflicts at all levels, from interpersonal to international, tend to become intractable. He defines intractable conflicts as ones that have acute and lasting antagonism, resist mediation, defy conventional wisdom, drag on and on, worsening over time. Once we are pulled in to intractable conflicts, he says, it is nearly impossible to escape. Intractable conflicts rule us. Another way to define intractable conflicts is by example. Most of my students immediately think of Israel and Palestine, and indeed, that is an intractable conflict. So too are the civil war in Syria, the wars in Congo and Yemen, and lots of other international and civil wars currently raging around the world. Now we're also looking at terrorism and non-state actors such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS and Boko Haram. Unfortunately, we don't know how to deal with these problems yet. We have ideas, but clearly nothing has been working very well. So I would put these in the intractable co category as well. The Fund for Peace has been running something for a long time that they used to call the Failed State Index. They now call it the Fragile State Index. The states at the top of the list uh, are ones that have already failed or are at high risk for doing so. On, you can see here that the 2015 index has South Sudan, Somalia, Central African Republic, and Sudan on very high alert. And Congo, Chad, Yemen, Syria is down to nine as being on high alert. 
I find it s very sobering, sobering that Syria is number nine on the list. These two are intractable conflicts. We have intractable conflicts here in the United States as well. One thing that's getting a lot of press and has a lot of concern is gross inequality. We talk about the 1% and plutocracy. This is a Bill Moyer show from 2012, and the situation hasn't gotten any better. This is a big conflict in the United States and other places. Who has the most money? Who has the most power? Who has the most f influence and what they do with it? This too is, in, is an intractable conflict. We see this too in fracturing democracies in the United States and in Europe. If we're going to try to go around the world establishing democracies in other places, it seems to guy and me that it would be good if we could show that our democracy works here first. But it isn't working so well here in the United States. We shut down the government or have come close to it several times in the last few years because Republicans and Democrats can't agree on how to fund it. They can't agree on whether or not to replace Justice uh, Supreme Court Justice Scalia, who recently died, we can't agree on pretty much anything. Congress is getting practically nothing done. The European Union is under a lot of tension as well. It had been stressed already from widespread economic problems and the austerity measures implemented to correct them, which won't, weren't working. Now the Syrian refugees and Brexit may well tell the, tear the EU apart. So fracturing democracies in the developed democratic world are another intractable conflict issue. Short of civil war is hatred, fear, and polarization. We've had a serious conflict recently in the United States over Planned Parenthood. We've had another serious intractable conflict involving violence on blacks by police and vice versa. We have a presidential candidate in 2016 who, among other things, has espoused, espoused closing our border to Muslims and building a wall to block people coming into the United States from Mexico and Central and South America. And we also have plenty of homegrown hatred, fear, and polarization with our own red-blue divide. Lastly, I would argue there is bad decision-making. A former colleague of ours, Kenneth Boulding, talked about the law of political irony. He defined that as everything you do to help people hurts them, and everything you do to hurt people helps them. The Iraq War, Operation Iraqi Freedom, is one good example of this. We thought getting rid of Saddam Hussein would have been bringing the Iraqis freedom and peace. It didn't work out that way. The austerity measures in Europe were supposed to stabilize their economies. That didn't work out very well either. That's what's being pictured in, uh, protested on the picture on the lower left. Another example in the United States is our penchant for cleanliness. Started with dishwashers in the 1950s and now we have antibiotic soap and cleansers and all sorts of things in the 80s and 90s. And now it's appearing that these things are making us sicker rather than healthier. Because we haven't developed the antibodies that we used to have and we're creating antibiotic resistant bacteria and we're falling prey to diseases that used to be pretty much cured. And all of this is caused because we've been making bad decisions because we don't understand how the system works. And this is true in many other cases. Why does this happen? Well, I would argue it's because we confuse simple problems with complicated problems with complex problems. We're going to explain in future videos what the difference is there. But to suffice it to say for now that when you assume that complex problems are simple problems, you tend to make bad mistakes. So once again, I want to leave you with a question. When I teach intractability in face-to-face -face classes, I put a continuum like this one up on the board, running from tractable on the left to intractable on the right. 
I note that intractability is not an either-or kind of thing. It's a continuum. Look at the list of major problems facing the United States that we talked about in the Why We Can't Solve Anything video. Where would you put those things on this continuum? What does it tell you about the nature of these conflicts? And what does that tell you about what we need to do to solve them? We will be talking about this a lot more. Right now, it's just something to think about. Thanks for watching.